Greetings fellow learners. Now before we get into this wonderful world of time series forecasting with the informer, I have a thought provoking question for you. What is your favorite part about machine learning? Is it the modeling, the understanding of data, the hyperparameter tuning, the testing, or something else? Now, as I make my own journey as a machine learning engineer, I've been understanding the importance of understanding more than just the code or just the actual core modeling. In fact, I personally enjoy ML system design as I build more AI solutions to products in companies. So turning this question over to you, what is your favorite part about machine learning? And I would love to hear your thoughts. Now, this video is going to be divided into a few passes as we are going to walk through the coding of the training and inference phase, along with some other phases of the informer architecture. Through this playlist of videos, we have seen the informer architecture at its core from like the core machine learning operation standpoint. But now we are going to take a higher level in just trying to actually make you know, load a data set, try to make some inference on this. So let's get to it. So for this first pass, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the GitHub repository for the open source informer architecture, and we're going to open the given Colab notebook that they have right over here. And I kind of opened that here in another tab. And in this notebook, we're gonna walk through it, but try to explain every line going forward. And I've also added some like logging features so that we can see some extra features going on, but it's gonna be fun. So first we're gonna execute this cell right over here to download the data set. And when you're doing all of this, make sure that you activate your GPU right here in Colab. And once you do that, you run this first cell you can also open the side panel in order to see all the file structures. And you can see here that here we have downloaded the informer code from the open source repository on the first line. And the second line is going to download the data set. The data set that we use here is going to be the electricity transformer data set or the ET data set. And the nature of the data, it kind of looks like this where we have hourly transformer based data, where we have data from 2016 to about 2018. It's gonna be about like 17,000 examples where we have a date followed by seven features over here. Now we could make predictions for all of these features using some multivariate forecasting, but in this case, we're probably just going to stick to oil temperature as the target variable. Coming back to our code here, you can kind of see the data set is loaded over here and we'll be using the smaller version of this data set, ETT small. So here we'll set a system path for the informer 2020. And then we'll run now the section to train and test our experiments. So we're just gonna import a few libraries. And then we have these huge list of arguments that we can kind of go through they're all arguments that we have discussed previously in a video when talking about the full code for the informer, but I'll also mention some extra ones here too. So first of all, the model that we're going to use is the informer architecture. There's a couple of models that are here. There's another model, which is the informer stack, which basically includes the core informer architecture, but there's more that's kind of built around it too. For this case though, we're really just considered about the core informer architecture that we have been talking about through this playlist of videos, and hence we set it as just the informer. Next, we're going to check the data source. This is going to be the ETTH1 data. So this is just the current data set that we just looked at for transformers. And we're gonna just define like the path in which we can find that data set, which is this ETT small right over here and the CSV as well, this H1 CSV. Next, we're gonna look at the features here. The features we set as M, which is basically saying that we want to perform like a multivariate analysis. So we saw that there was like seven columns in the data. We're gonna be forecasting for all of those seven features. And we could have just 
very well just executed it just as a univariate analysis if we just had like one of those features that we wanted to forecast over time. Or we can also do MS, which is multivariate inputs, like seven inputs, and then just like the single output for like the oil temperature. The target we set to be oil temperature, the column. The frequency is H, which stands for hourly because we have hourly data in our data set. Then checkpoints, the checkpoints folder is going to be set to be the informer underscore checkpoints location. Let's just put that here. And that's going to be appearing right over here. So sequence length, this indicates what is the number of input vectors that we are passing in simultaneously into our encoder architecture. And this is going to be 96 time steps. So in this case, it's 96 hourly time steps, which is basically like four days of data that we're passing directly into our encoder. Label len is 48. This indicates the context vectors that we are passing into the decoder architecture to start our predictions. Because here, the decoder architecture is typically going to take like the last chunk of whatever we put into the input, that's gonna be put into the decoder itself too in order to generate predictions. And we're gonna take the last 48 time steps to do so. PredLen is going to be what is the number of time steps that we want to predict on the output of the decoder. And this is going to be 24. So just to see like how these three numbers actually come to play, let's look at an architecture diagram. This here is an entire encoder decoder architecture diagram for the informer architecture. And if you wanna know exactly like how each and every single component works, I've created a video right over here, but you can check that out later if you haven't seen it already. But the main focus, what I wanna bring in is the input to the encoder and the input to the decoder. So zooming into this encoder input, you could see we have a batch size of 32. We're passing in 96 length of the sequence, and each of those is going to have seven data points, which we saw in the data set. Now, we would pass this into the encoder, but also for the decoder, we're going to extract like the last half of this data set, that is the last 48 vectors. And then we're going to concatenate with some padding vectors. This is going to be like some 24 padding vectors of zeros. So that's going to be like 72 vectors right over here, which you're going to pass into the decoder in order to make some predictions. And eventually, those 24 padded vectors that we have over here, if we scroll all the way to the end of the decoder, they are going to encapsulate our predictions over here. And hence, we have the numbers 96, 48, and then 24. So coming back to the code, we know why we now see these numbers. Next is the encoder in, enc in, which is seven. That is the number of features per time series vector. In this case, it is seven. The deck in, it's again, the number of features passed into the decoder, it's again seven. C out is the number of features that we output from the decoder, which is again seven for the prediction. Factor five, this is internally going to be used in prop sparse attention to determine the number of queries or key vectors that are internally going to be sampled. So it's a, it's a hyperparameter that we set for, for prop sparse attention internally. D model is again internal to the informer architecture where we set the Im internal embedding sizes to be like 512 dimensions. N heads is eight. This is specifically used in multi-head attention where we can we use multi-head attention so that the neural network can understand more complexities in data along eight different paths in parallel. Next is E layers this is the number of encoder layers. In this case, we set it to two. D layers is the number of decoder layers, which we set to one. DFF is the number of, or rather the embedding length of the internal full feed forward network, which is 2048. Next is dropout. This is just a parameter for the dropout, which indicates like the probability of the number of neurons to turn off. And we turn off neurons randomly so that during the test phase, we are going to see an increase in testing performance. Attention is going to be prob, which is going to say, hey, for the encoder part, we want to use prob sparse attention as opposed to full attention. And prob sparse attention helps increase the efficiency for especially like longer sequences of time series data. 
Time F is going to be like the time features encoding. So this is going to, um, we're going to see like how exactly we want to encode global timestamp information into our current time series vectors. From an architecture standpoint, it's basically going to be used in this global timestamp section in the beginning over here. Like how do we construct this? That's gonna be determined by the embed argument. Next, we have an activation function over here, which is going to be GELU. Next is a distillation. Distill is equal to true, basically sets distillation is going to be true, and the distillation process is required if we want some more efficiency in the encoder part of the architecture. Output attention, this is going to determine whether or not we want to output attention vectors. So it could be either like true or false. Mix is true. This is going to just do some very internal um, rearrangement of parameters. So it's a pretty minor argument here. Padding is zero indicates padding for our input time series vectors. We want to set it hourly for hourly data. Batch size is 32. We want to pass in 32 items at a time to our network to make predictions for 32 um, series of data at a time. Learning rate, this is like an initial learning rate that we set here. The loss is going to be a mean squared error, which is very typical for regression type problems. LR adjusted or LR ADJ, this is gonna specify how our learning rate should be adjusted. And if we look at the actual code base to see like where this is used, you can see that the learning rate is going to be modified in this way over time. Or we could specify it as type two, and depending on like the epochs, you could see that the learning rate is going to diminish over time in this way. Overall, these are just gonna be different learning rate methods to tune over time that they should decrease over time as we're trying to optimize for uh, the correct optimum. Mixed precision training, it's gonna be set to false, but if this was set to true, it would use mixed precision training, which would typically all the gradients that are used in the network, it would have cut the floating point precision instead of using 32, it would have used something much less like 16 floating point precision in order to in order to make the training process more efficient at the cost of maybe a little bit of accuracy. Num workers is basically going to introduce what is the efficiency of like the data loading process. You can set this to different numbers for especially like larger data sets that you want to load. It might be more efficient. ITR in this case, it's just going to be the number of times that we're actually going to train our model. We're just sending it to one. Epochs is the total number of iterations for every single ITR or <laughs> for one training session. We're going to train with six epochs, like over six times the entire data set. Patience is going to be a parameter that's going to be used in early stopping. So in the event that our validation MSE or mean squared error or error is not going to change over the epochs, we are actually going to stop the training after you know, the third iteration after we stop seeing any improvement in our model. DES is simply like a descriptor. And I know EXP here in general is a variable that we're going to be using to reference the informer architecture. Now using GPU in this case, it's going to be true because we have like a CUDA machine available right here. And we set using the multiple GPUs to false in this case. So let's execute this cell by pressing command enter. Next, we're just going to set the usage to be GPUs over here. And now we're going to do some loading of data. So first of all, there's multiple data sets that are available to us. And like we mentioned before, we're going to use the ETTH1 with some parameters that are listed over here. So what this is saying is that, hey, we want to first just make use of ETTH1 CSV, which we already defined in our arguments data above. And what we're gonna do here is we wanna say the target is going to be OT, which is the oil temperature. That's the target that we want to truly forecast. And we're also going to say that the features here are going to be, well, in this case, we already know features is M. That is, we wanna do like a multivariate analysis. That's how we initialized this to begin with. So if we go way to the beginning over here, I think we already initialized like features as M. So scrolling down all the way here again, you'll see that it's going to be 777. So enc in is gonna be seven, dec in is gonna be seven, and c out is gonna be seven, which makes sense because we have seven uh, features for the that we wanna pass into the encoder. 
seven features we want to pass into the decoder, and seven features we want to get out of the decoder. So let's execute this cell. And then we also have like a details frequency over here. So let me just execute this. And just to show you that we want to do this on an hourly basis, we can actually just kind of like see this as well. So it should be H and it is H, right? And then if we want to look at the args in the experiments, let's do that. And you can just see all of the arguments that we have that we discussed just above. Now, right here, EXP, this is the first, what is the kind of model that we want to reference? This is going to be the EXP informer architecture. To understand what the EXP informer is, is that we go to the EXP underscore informer dot pi in the EXP folder of the open source architecture. And you can kind of see a class over here that says EXP informer. And that's going to be used to like build the actual model. So we have like building the model over here. Then we have a function to get the data over here. And then we can also train, validate, and also make predictions on the data set over here too. So all of this is just in one class right here called exp underscore informer. And that's what we're referencing. So we have exp informer. Next, let's load our data set, which was in that ETTH1 and we'll look at the data itself. And you can kind of see here, there's 17,000 records and there is hourly data for seven fields. So let's look at the arguments again, right over here. If we display the arguments, uh, you can kind of see the exact same arguments that we just talked about previously that's listed out right over here. And it's these arguments that, you know, if you were building a custom data set yourself, you would want to set based on the way that I've explained it so far. And then training is actually quite simple over here. So let me just start this. This is going to kick off a training process. So let me just start that training so that it'll just take like a few minutes anyways. So when you're seeing this training process, also pay attention to this side because there might be like some folders that are created here. So essentially what's happening is that we now are going to create this file name over here. And it's in this file name that we're actually going to create our uh, training checkpoints. So you'll have like the model stored over here once the training is complete. Now this line over here, so let's just actually see what we're doing. So we're gonna use a GPU. We have a GPU available. Next is this is gonna be an informer architecture. We're gonna use the ETT H1 dataset feature. It's gonna be multivariate M. The sequence length is 96. The, the label length is 48 because that's what we're passing into the decoder. The prediction length is 24. Ooh, you can actually see the checkpoints that now populated over here, right? Just to, to see what's going on, right? And then this DM is going to be 512. That's the D model. That's 512 dimensions internally, eight attention heads. We have two encoder layers, one decoder layer, internal 2048, that's for feed forward networks. And then uh, we, we're, using we're using prob sparse attention in the encoder. Uh, we're using a factor of five. Um, we're using time frequency for um, global timestamp embeddings. Uh, we are also using the distillation as well as mix is set to true. And this is like the first training iteration overall. And we only have one training iteration. ITR was set to one after all. So this here is now going to call the actual informer, or it's going to conform. It's going to call specifically it's exp underscore informer, which will internally call informer, and then it's going to train the model right over here, and then we're going to test the model and we're going to empty our cache. So now the files that were created we just discussed were informer checkpoints. And we also got this results folder right over here for the same model. And under results, we have the true values of like what this should have been. We have the predicted values as well as some metrics. So this is stuff that we're going to plot out and just like see later on, just to see like how well our model is actually performing. We can create some cool graphs and charts. We can also visualize attention and so forth. Now let's look at like what, what this here is actually saying. So what happened is that we've iterated only one iteration because, you know, 
this is only one, right? It's like just one, one time. Next, what we're gonna do here is you see this training validation set and test set of like how many examples we're using. We are making logs for every like 100 examples. And what you can see here is that you have a train loss, a validation loss, and a test loss. And you can see like for like these like first 100 iterations, it's fine. And you can see that there is probably not much of a difference right over here. It's only the train loss that's actually decreasing out of here. And because like there's not much of a difference between the validation loss here and the validation loss here, we now trigger an early stopping. And early stopping, you can see, is going to happen right here. It says early stopping counter one of three, because three was, why three? It's because we set that to be our patience. And the this is going to prevent our model from overfitting, because it'll be like, okay, validation is not getting any better. What we're gonna do is now, we're just gonna stop this model from training altogether, but we're gonna stop after like three main epoch iterations. So that's why, we iterate one here, two, and then three, and then we perform the stopping criteria. And then training is complete. And during this time too, you're not really seeing much of an improvement in the model itself. In fact, the validation loss slightly increased in test error, which indicates potentially there might be some more overfitting here, which, you know, I could probably tune my model a little bit to adjust for accounting for this. But for at least instructional purposes, I hope you know how to like read this piece of information so that you can tune your model accordingly. Next is like testing here. So what we're gonna do is you could see that the prediction outputs, we have a batch size of 32 and we are getting a prediction of 24 sequences because we're predicting 24 of the next time steps at a given time. And each of those is gonna have an output like number of features is gonna be seven. That's gonna be like the test shape. And we have 2,848 individual predictions here because we're just probably gonna, we're just gonna like multiply these two together because after all, they're just like a bunch of predictions. So we're collapsing these first two dimensions. And what we can do now is actually visualize these predictions just to see like how well they've performed. And we have like uh, an MSE as well as a mean absolute error. So that's gonna be the training phase. Now, if you want to make predictions, what you wanna do now is first read your model checkpoint. So let's just look at the checkpoint path and read this path right over here. I created a cell by accident, so let's delete that. And now let's actually just make predictions. So if we do like make predictions, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna like sample a single, a single sample here. That's right over here, it says one, which means that we're making predictions on just one sample, and we already are using a GPU because it's just on right in the corner over here. Now, when you execute this cell, you're gonna notice that there's like a single file that is created right over here called real underscore prediction, and this is just going to be like a single prediction. So in order to see like what that prediction looks like, you can see that it's just a one cross 24 cross seven dimensional tensor, and you can just like, read that tensor itself. And this is just going to be the predictions for all the seven features that we described. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following types of predictions is the informer designed for? A, univariate forecasting. B, multivariate forecasting. C, sentence translation. Or D, text summarization. Note here that multiple options may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answers are A and B, but can you tell me why? So comment your reasoning down below and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this point, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's gonna do it for pass one of this explanation and quiz one, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. So in pass one, now that we described how to, you know, read the data and actually perform some training and testing fairly simple and also just like get predictions very easily, let's actually look a little bit more deep into this predict function over here because 
it really looks like a black box right now. So let's expand that out right here on more details about prediction. So we have this predict function and internally what it's actually doing is just a bunch of stuff right over here. So this predict function is essentially first, it's going to load data from this checkpoint that we described right over here. And then we are going to now set the model to evaluation mode being like, hey, we actually want to make some predictions here. And then what we're going to do is actually load data from this pred loader over here. And if you want to know where this is coming from specifically, it's going to be a part of the exp informer get data. And we're passing in a prediction flag. And this is that definition of get data, which is under exp informer right over here. So we are analyzing this data set right here. We are then setting this flag to prediction, which is here, which means that the batch size is just going to be one because we just want to get a single prediction right now. And then what we do is we create a data set and then we also create a data loader and return the data set along with the data loader. Data sets and data loaders work hand in hand and are very common in PyTorch and so as to provide a unified way of creating and formatting data and also fetching and reading and writing data too. And so jumping back to the code, we can see that this is going to be our essentially our data loader and it's going to be loading batch X, batch Y, batch X mark and batch Y mark. So batch X and batch Y are just like individual, I guess, since we're only, we're in the prediction or the pred flag is turned on. It's just gonna be a batch of one. And batch X is essentially just gonna be the shape of like 96 cross seven, because this is going to eventually be fed into the informer encoder. Now batch Y is eventually going to be fed into the informer decoder and it's gonna be used as that context. So it's the last 48 of batch X. And so it's gonna be one cross 48 cross seven right over here. So that's one cross 48 cross seven. And this is going to be, batch X is gonna be one cross 96 cross seven. And then batch X mark is going to be, it's gonna indicate the, um, the global timestamps for each of these 96 cases. So for each of these like 96 examples, it's going to indicate for hourly data, it's gonna indicate four major global timestamp points. It's gonna be the month of the year, the hour of the day, the week date, and it's also going to be like the date of the month. So that's gonna be four. And then the Y mark is gonna be very similar, but for again, for the decoder. So for these like one cross 48 cases, it's gonna be just of size four. To understand where that four number came from, we already know that here we are, we passed in like the frequency is going to be H, right? And H right here basically says that we're going to encode time. We're going to add like four of these features from timestamp data, which is the month, the day, the weekday, and the hour. And this is why we see that dimension four. Coming back to our code here, we are going to determine what the input to the decoder should be. So in this case, the padding is zero. That's what we described in the very beginning. And because the padding is zero, we're going to create the input to the decoder like we mentioned by taking the last part of the 48 from the encoder. So this is gonna be like 48 from the encoder. That's this shape over here, plus the prediction length. The pred len is the number of features that we want to output from the decoder. So that's gonna be 24. And this is essentially going to be 72. And it's gonna be both of these. So that's like 72 right here times whatever the batch Y last shape of it is. So that's gonna be seven. So it's gonna be um, 72 cross seven right over here. And so when we actually print out the decoder, you're gonna see it's like 72 cross seven right over here, or rather like one cross 72 cross seven. In this case, it's gonna check if we wanna use mixed precision training, which we're not gonna do. And so it's gonna execute this part where should we output attention? In this case, we will execute this line where we're just getting the first case because here, when we actually make the call to the model, this is actually gonna make the forward pass call to the informer architecture. And when you make the forward pass call to the informer, it's gonna return two values. The first is the main output, and the second one is going to be the attention vectors. So this here is just going to return just the output itself. 
And this is going to return, of course, just the output if you know the attention values are false. And we're actually gonna print that out right over here just so that we can see what's going on. And we already know that the output shape should be of one cross 24 cross seven. And let's just make this one. In this case, the dimensions over here, this here is gonna be false. So it's gonna be zero right here. And hence, what we're gonna do is for the batch, we're gonna extract just the last 24 predictions. And so it's gonna be like a one cross 24 cross seven right over here. Because I think batch Y was like 48. This is now going to be uh, 24. The prediction outputs, outputs over here was going to be also like a one cross 24 cross, one cross 24 cross seven. And the outputs that we see in the predictions over here is also going to be the same, one cross 24 cross seven, and that's going to be our single prediction right here. And then we're gonna save all of this into the results folder, which is exactly why we see this folder right over here. And we're gonna save it under like the real predictions too. And had you executed this, then you can also see here that this folder would have also been executed. So you can see how this entire function is just a deep dive of like what we would see just by using this like single line of code right over here. So scrolling here, you can actually see, for example, let's just confirm that what we're seeing is correct. We're seeing this, we, we're in flag is one, prediction mode is one. The batch X, this is going to be passed into the encoder. That's one cross 96 cross seven, which is correct. And this is the value of it. It's a long tensor. Next is batch Y. This is going to be passed into, well, the one part of it passed into the decoder right over here, which is one cross 48 cross seven. And this is the value. You'll notice that with batch X though, like batch X and batch Y are actually related. Like we mentioned before, the, the latter half of batch X is actually batch Y. So for example, you can see this last value of batch X here, it's gonna be 0 0.387. And you can see in the last value of batch Y, it actually matches, right? And the same is true for, you know, if you wanna go here, 0 0.264. And last but one is gonna be 0 0.264. So you could see that like, maybe you could see like there will be a halfway point somewhere over here where all of this is essentially going to be the same as what you see in batch Y over here. Batch X mark is gonna indicate like the timestamp information, which is gonna be of like the four feature lengths. And these values are going to be normalized internally. And that's why we see them as such here. And this along with, of course, like the one cross 72 cross four tensor for batch Y mark is in all of these four cases, batch X, batch Y, batch X mark, batch Y mark, they are going to be passed into the informer in order to make the outputs. So you can see here that the decoder input right now is going to be one cross 72 cross seven, where so you can see the 48 of the 72 is just, a, this is essentially batch Y, right? And you can see that what's being passed into the decoder is just a bunch of zeros over here, which is just the padding. And these are eventually going to be updated with the outputs. That's why if you look at the outputs, which is one cross 24 cross seven, these are the outputs that, that we are looking at right here, the outputs of the model. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Why do we pass in batch X mark and batch Y mark into the informer? A, to transform the current vectors to recognize complex patterns. B, to add position level information to the input vectors. C, to add timestamp level information to the input vectors. Or D, they are optionally added as they don't provide much value. Note here that multiple options may be correct. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is C, but can you tell me why? Comment your reasoning down below and let's have a discussion. And that's gonna do it for quiz two and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. 
Now, for this third pass, I actually went ahead and restarted the notebook just to retrain the model, because I think there were some issues with like initial variables when I was just trying to train it here, because I did see that the model was overfitting quite a bit. And so you can see like the visualizations of that oil temperature for the 24 timestamps now look like this. And just scrolling back really quick to the top over here, you can see that the early stopping criteria Let's go over here. You can see that the model trained for slightly longer because it no longer stopped as soon as it did before. Because I think after this first epoch, the model actually started encountering situations of overfitting. But at least here you can see that the validation loss is actually still continuing to decrease. It's only until it hits this point that the validation loss increases a little where we're now encountering early stopping. Early stopping and eventually we stop model training. So I just wanted to throw this out there so that you know why like the graphs look different a little bit. And so we get a chart that looks like this. Now let's actually get a comparison between these predicted values and also the actual values just to see how you, know, you can visualize what errors look like. So we'll go to this visualization section over here and we're gonna make use of under results. We're gonna do, we're gonna compare the true values to the predicted values and in this case, we actually read 2,848 test examples for which we have made predictions. And we want to just like make predictions on them. So I'm just getting the first of those samples. And of these seven cases or these seven um, features, really, we really cared about the oil temperature, right? So this is going to be like the set of predictions for the 24 predictions for the oil temperature over time. And this are 24 predictions of oil temperature. That is the actual like ground truth. And if we use matplotlib over here and plot these values, you can kind of see that, okay, there's at least now some semblance of how the current oil prediction, which is like the orange chart is kind of mimicking and doing pretty well in mimicking the, the ground truth itself. Now, because like we set before, that we set the features to be M, which was like a multivariate, you can also predict some other charts too, right? Like the HUFL. So instead of predicting the last feature, what we do is we predict the first feature or the first column, which is zero. And it looks, the comparison looks like this. And we can also use that to predict, let's say the second column, which index with index one, which is the HULL prediction that looks kind of like this. It's not picking up very well on this specifically, but I think you get the point of how you can also visualize your multivariate um, prediction cases. What we want to do right now is try to visualize a tension that happened in the encoder architecture. So we want to see those attention values. We can again create our data set and data loader, and we're loading this in the testing environment just so that we can see like multiple examples. We then now initialize our informer architecture model by reading the trained architecture that we stored right over here in the checkpoints. And when we want to visualize it, we're basically going to, again, construct for the informer. It requires, again, a batch X, batch Y, and also the batch X mark and batch Y mark, like we described previously. And we would want to pass all of that into the model itself. And the model is going to output the actual model outputs and also the attention matrices. Now, in this case, we had two encoder layers. And so we will have these like two attention variables over here. So one of these attention variables is going to be 96 cross 96 across eight attention heads. This is because the input sequence length was 96 cross 96 and we did multi-head attention. So there's eight. And then after the initial encoding, we're gonna do distillation, which would squish the number of um, time steps by half, only passing in the very richest information. And then we pass this into the next encoder, which is gonna be half, because it's half of this, it's gonna be like 48 cross 48. If you want more details on exactly like how we get these shapes, you can look at my previous video on the entire coded architecture of the informer, which I'll link to right here. And so what we can do is now visualize eight of these 96 cross 96 attention matrices as like heat maps. And so let's just do that. So you can kind of see here that this here is like for 
the first encoder layer, we have performed like prop sparse attention. Now, what was the attention values that were learned? Because in the input, we passed in like 96 sequences. So we have like a 96 cross 96 tensor, and hence we have that heat map. And you can see that there are some attention values that show some interest or importance over here. And these values range between zero and one, right? So these are the higher attention values. Similarly, this is for layer zero head one. So this is the next attention head. And like this, we will have eight such attention heads, right? So if we scroll all the way down here, I also wanted to see, okay, what is the attention that is going to be learned by these, uh, the next layer? And this will actually show like whether distillation truly helped propagate these layers correctly. Like for example, you can see that in this, the second layer head, I guess, in this case, you could see that there is still information here that is retained. And if you compare this to the first layer's second attention head, what did that look like? It looked like this too, very similar, where we had only very few of these examples truly of like actual importance. So what we were able to now visually see here is that even though this heat map or matrix is technically four times larger, right? It's 96 cross 96 versus the next layers 48 cross 48, but this 48 cross 48 still was able to retain the information that was also seen in the input, which means that distillation truly did make the compression that we needed to while still retaining the information that we wanted. And this is how like through using distillation, you can like visually see how important the distillation process is in actually making the prop sparse attention efficient. So, that's kind of the main crux of what I wanted to show you in this video. And if you wanted to have and load your custom data set, you could do so by just replacing the CSV using the format that I provided, like using the original data set format of creating a date column. It has to be called a date. And then you have, whether it's hourly or daily data, whatever it is in that order, you would also create the individual columns that you would want to forecast. And then you set the argument parameters accordingly. So you have your data, and then you set your argument parameters, you create your um, data set, you create a data loader, and then because you have a data set and data loader created, you can now create these batch X, batch Y, batch X mark, batch Y mark, and this information can all be passed in to the informer architecture to make predictions. Quiz time. Ooh, this is going to be a fun one. Why is distillation performed? A, to reduce the size of the tensors in the encoder. B, to make the attention operation more efficient. C, to increase the accuracy of the concatenated encoder features. Or D, to increase the accuracy of the decoder outputs. Note here too that multiple options may be correct. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answers are A and B. But can you tell me why? Comment your reasoning down below and let's have a discussion. And at this point, if you do think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's going to do it for quiz time and pass three of this explanation. But before we go, let's generate a summary. As a summary of what we have done in this video. So first of all, we took a look at this collaboratory notebook for the informer architecture, where we started with coding and downloading the data set. We then experimented with just training and immediately testing this data set using like very simple commands. And then we dug deeper into like, okay, how do we make predictions using that predict function? What does it actually entail? And also showed some visualizations of comparing the actual predictions to the true predictions, as well as some attention vectors, just to show how distillation really is valuable in this entire process. And then also left a snippet here for your custom data set and data loader.
And that's all that we have for today. Thank you all so much for watching this playlist of videos. The link to the main architecture diagrams and some of this code is going to be down in the description below. And also if you wanted to see exactly how the, and if you just visited this video on its own and you're still now curious about how the encoder works, and if you just saw this video on your own and you see, okay, this is how I use the informer, but you're really interested in how the informer actually works, well, you can go back to the beginning of this playlist and I will link that first video right over here. Thank you all so much for watching. If you think I do deserve it, please do give this video a like and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.